So we've dealt with happiness, contentedness, and then we come to the awkwardly phrased, not quite as awkward as contentedness, but this. Suspension of judgment. What could this possibly mean? Don't judge. Suspend judges? Well, what does this mean? Well, to this end, we're going to look at two, the works of two specific thinkers. On the Greek side of things, we're going to take a look at, and this is what we're going to ask for today, Sextus and Thiricus. And then we're going to look at Jonxus. Now, Jonxus would be considered part of the Taoist tradition as well, although if you went back in time and said, hey, Jonxus, you're a Taoist, he would probably look at you kind of funny. It's, yeah, Lao Tzu is cool, I guess, but all right. He wouldn't have that same kind. We, we kind of look backwards and put that identity upon him. I'm not sure that he would. He would just say, yeah, I'm, I'm into some books, I think. Uh, Sexist Empiricus, on the other hand, would very self-consciously identify as a skeptic. In the classical sense. The word. Remember, that's one of the four Hellenistic schools that I described before. The Stoics, the Cynics, the Epicureans. This, there's the Skeptics. And I think here, in his Outlines of Pyrrhonism, in his Outlines of Pyrrhonism, he Describe some, I think it's called general principles in your Hellenistic philosophy volume. He kind of outlines the ancient view of skepticism. Now, he's a later skeptic. There are earlier skeptics. Carneades would be one. Of these are names you don't have to know. But like Carneades, uh, it's called Pyrrhonism after Pyrrho of Elis. Elis is basically Elis would basically be Bosnia today. Um, or on the on the uh, uh, Aegean coast, Adriatic coast. And um, so the old way of referring to skeptics was Pyrrhonism. So if you ever see the term Pyrrhonism, it's, it's referring to classical skepticism, as opposed to modern skepticism. Uh, makes me think of like Michael Shermer, who's the editor of Skeptic Magazine today. There's a different flavor to modern skepticism. So and some of the words we used before too, like I said, there's modern usages of the word Stoic. There's modern usages of the word Epicurean, even though they're Rare, I'd say. Um, Taoist, I don't think I really see modern usages of that. Except I do, I do see occasionally people use Taoist principles to refer to an attitude in Japanese Buddhism where people go, that's really Zen. But that's about as far as I can see from Chinese thought that happening. Uh, when we say, when we talk about uh, modern skepticism, when someone is referred to as skeptical, what do we mean by this? They don't use the word they don't easily believe. They don't easily believe things. I'm not gullible, right? That's what it means to be skeptical. Is that what the ancient skeptics maintained by skepticism? Not exactly. Okay, so there's this there's this sense in which modern skepticism not only believes that I I, I would affirm that, but there's also an addendum of neither am I going to waste my time with that shit. Okay, like that, that's really, and I say that with those words on purpose because that's kind of the attitude. Okay, uh, I think of Richard Dawkins every time he opens his mouth, really talking about any subject with which he's not an expert. Uh, it could be, uh, it could be religion. It could be continental philosophy. All right, talking about Jean-Paul Sartre, continental philosophy. There's no such thing as continental physics. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, and that really just look at his Twitter account, uh, and occasionally he'll say. Uh, a survey thing. He has some good book, like The Selfish Gene in 1970s. is an amazing book on evolutionary biology. But as soon as Richard Dawkins opens his mouth about really anything else, he ends up putting his foot in it. Um, that's not to say that he's wrong on things either. 
and so forth. Like his, the attitude is antagonistic and demeaning. Okay, <laughs> the, the new atheism. Okay, uh, it's not new, and it's not particularly remarkable. Uh, Sam Harris comes to mind. He has a similar kind of attitude. The late Christopher Hitchens also similar kind of attitude as well. Where it's not just I'm not going to believe things easily. It's also people who do believe things easily are idiots. That's not classic skepticism. But I want to stress that as a difference. People, people will say that. People will often conflate the two. So I want to make sure that's clear. So this classic skepticism, Pyrrhonism, skepsis, again, comes from the word just means to question things. Not to demean them, but to question them. In what way? Well, I think Sextus Empiricus has a really straightforward and systematic way of talking about what's the, how, we're, how to be a skeptic. Really, that's what that little book is. Here's how to be a skeptic. Here's what we do. It'd be a little pamphlet that you'd see. <laughs> Skepticism in you. So, how do you be a skeptic? Well, I want to get into that, but before that, there's two principles that I want to go ahead and preview that are a big deal for skepticism. Where, and they're the really virtues of skepticism. Like, here's what we're going after. Two things. Ataraxia, one, two, Epikey, two there. These are really the two main principles of, or really the goals, the virtues of skeptic thought. And those are two Greek words specifically that I do want you to know. There's not going to be a test on it. <laughs> Just no, I'm going to recommend you know these. We'll come to you later, bud. Ataraxia. What do you think? Well, let me give you quick, quick definitions of these, and then we'll see them fleshed out as we go through sexist and period. Ataraxia. Literally. Um, this. this is how it's often translated. So I'm just going to put the classic translation. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if the English is helpful there or not. So we'll break that down in a moment. <laughs> any word, the English word that has a turb in it, of which there are many, some of it becomes mute. So yeah, disturbed, imperturbed. All right. But imperturbed would be not disturbed. So that's what this means. Okay. Ataraxia. I am not going to be mentally bothered by. Distur disturbed is almost too much. That means almost a bad, <laughs> a bad turb. But this one, I'm not, my mind is not messed with. So that's one of the skeptic goals. I'm not going to let my mind get messed with. In what way? Well, and this goes back to, remember, each one of these Hellenistic schools, while they have their specific founders, each of them sees themselves as simply replicating whatever it was Socrates was doing. Okay, so remember Socrates' proclamation was, I know one thing, and that's that I know nothing, and I'm okay with that. 
focusing on Socrates' attitude. I know that I'm ignorant about some things, and I'm not distressed about it. This is the first feature, the first virtue, really, of skepticism. You're never going to know everything. And that's okay. You'll find as you continue to pursue knowledge, the older you get, <laughs> assuming that you're the, every, some of your <laughs> intellectual arrogance declines with you, I'm not indicting anyone in here, but I think as you, one gets older, you realize there's less and less that you do know. And I'm not just making fun of older people who don't know how to rotate PDFs, okay? I mean in the sense that even, even when you specialize in something, you realize there's, I know very little about this thing. As you zoom in, your actual knowledge is more and more limited. And so you're going to realize more and more, I don't know the answer to that. I don't have the answer to that. We also live in a society where conversationally, we always, if someone asks a question, we want to definitively declare our answer. And it's almost an embarrassment to say, I don't know, or I'll have to get back on that. I'll have to, let, me, let, me, let me look into that, let me check that. Idiot. All right, no. So the skeptics say, listen, I'm just going to know everything. And don't let your mind be disturbed by the fact that you don't have answers to not just little questions of minutia, but also to big questions. What's the meaning of life? Chill. That's not the answer. Just if you don't know the answer immediately, it's OK. If there's infinite knowledge out there, not necessarily that there is, then the, the quantity of knowledge out in the world might be finite. But whether it is or not, you're not going to know everything, and that's okay. So stop trying to get ahead. I have to know everything. <laughs> In much wisdom, there is much sorrow. So just tone it down. So that's one principle. Don't be disturbed by the fact that you're not going to know everything. Not just that you don't now. You never will. Second principle, suspension of judgment. Or I've also put there, I've translated it there, also the withholding of assent. Well, what does it mean to assent to something? And this, this is actually opens up discussion of different levels of knowledge and what it means to know something, which is a question of epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Here, I want to go to zoom in on what I mean by knowledge. And I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go ahead and do it. We've got our Greek word for knowledge. Nope, that is not a final sigma. Gnosis, really where the English word knowledge comes from. The Latins would say, Scientia, we get our word science, knowledge. What does it mean to know something? So what does it mean to know something? What is it to have knowledge of something? Does that mean superficial familiarity? A rep the ability to replicate facts in your propositional statement, to be intimate with the knowledge of something. That's a Hebraic understanding of knowledge. We need to know something. Here I think a critic of the skeptics, in fact, he wrote a book called Contra Academicos uh, in the fourth century. At the time, the skeptics had taken over Plato's academy. So in the 4th century, late Roman period, the terms skeptic and academic were considered interchangeable. Uh, this critic that I'm referring to, Aurelius Augustinus, also the, aka St. Augustine, not Augustine, that's a different one. Augustine actually has a way, actually a diagram of thinking about knowledge. And it didn't originate with him, but I think he explains it really, really clearly. But there are basically three levels or three modes of knowledge. Augustine is helpful. Let's, so let's talk about knowledge 
<laughs> the tripartite division of knowledge. These three things aren't mutually exclusive either, really. They're like different levels. If you have, if you have the, the first one, you're going to have the second one. If you have, or, I'm sorry. If you have the second one, you're also going to have the first. If you have the third, you're also going to have the first two. So it builds. So this is the almost a scaffolding of knowledge. So let's see the three different levels of knowledge. Let's start with the first one, notitia. If you want to go church Latin, I'll make notitia, that's fine. Notitia. What does that mean? Well, I see some of you jotting things down right now. What are you jotting down? Notes. No, it's there it is. Basically, notitia, uh, you'll see this is the word for, this is the basic word for knowledge as just like the stuff you get off of Wikipedia, right? Just the, like the def the encyclopedia, encyclopedic or dictionary definitions, the facts, the notes. So if you have, you read the dictionary entry, you know, if you've ever, anyone ever seen a paper that starts, Webster's Dictionary defines don't start your paper like that, but it's, I, I see those a lot. All right, there. That's I know this person has notitional knowledge of something. Okay, they don't know the ins and outs of it, but they can at least replicate the facts. I assume no one in here is an astronomer or an astrophysicist, but I would imagine that all of you know that the Earth is what planet ordinarily in the solar system. Help me, I'm dying. <laughs> Melting! <laughs> Third, right? So if you like, you remember the big foam balls you made when you were a kid? Like, you know, you don't, you don't have to know anything else about space, but if you like, okay, we're the third planet from the sun. Right? If you know that, you've got nutritional knowledge of the solar system. Okay? Doesn't mean you're not going to go, you know, you're not trying to figure out what this, you know, this, what the speed of light would actually be. The answer is the speed of light. Um, but you're not going to know all that stuff, you have nutritional knowledge of something. You've got, you got the basic gist of things, you're good. Okay? That's knowledge. Knowledge level one. Knowledge level two. A census or a scent believing that something, believing that those little factoids are true. So you can have notitional knowledge without a scent. Alright, so this is, for example, let's say. Uh, no, no, notitional knowledge without a set. What would that look like? Oh, for example, um, Muhammad, when he went into the cave, was told by Jibra'il, Ikhra, read, recite, now, and then, okay, comes back down with some surahs from al Quran. Great. Now, you might have to be a Muslim to affirm or assent to that being true, but you can know the gist of the story and cite the facts without believing that they're true, yes? So you can have an additional knowledge of something without assenting to it. Further, uh, you can assent to that and also having an additional knowledge. Right? So if you're a Muslim, you know, like that thing you just said about Muhammad? And the, yeah, that really happened. Like, yeah, we've, got the, we've got the additional knowledge and the essential knowledge. I, I know that to be true. Now, of course, we can dispute with each other on this point. Great. But so if you believe something to be true, okay, now you've got a sense. Look, knowledge level three. Knowledge plus plus. This is the one Augustine's really into. Fiducia. And that's language that will come up if you ever sign a contract that involves money, but sometimes you'll see the adjective fiduciary. What is fiducia? What is fiduciary knowledge? Well, those of you who might know Latin roots, that fid. What is fid? <laughs> As in bona fide, sola fide, fideo, fidelity, there we go. 
whether you're talking about marriage or microphones. That's fidelity. I'll start using the yardstick. There we go. Take me back to, it's taking me back to high school. All right, I'm going to put that down. All right. Um, fidel yeah, loyalty, faithfulness. All right, so when you talk about marriage, fidelity, what is that? Not cheating. There we go. But when you talk about, say, microphones, the, the accuracy of the, the signal actually, or when it, comes to, when it comes to sound, okay, when we're talking about, say, when something's in, uh, say, 4K, it has a lot of, or even with visuals, it has high fidelity. If you ever open something up, especially with the campus Wi-Fi, and it looks really <laughs> uh, blocky, okay, it looks really pixelated, the fidelity there is not high. It's not faithful to the image as the image actually is. Okay, it's unfaithful to that. Okay, so with that being said, that's what faithful means. What does fiduciary or fiducia mean? Yeah, loyalty or faithfulness to this. Like almost a subscription. I don't mean like, like, I don't mean like Netflix. But subscription in the sense of I subscribe to this. Like I pledge myself to this. Okay, that's more than a set. This is now loyalty. To the idea. Okay, so here again, three levels of knowledge. And again, this is an like, Augustinian construction. Notitia. You know the facts. So if, <laughs> if you ever scrambled together a paper at the last minute where I, I am, I'm not doing the reading, I don't know what this is about, but I looked up some stuff in the encyclopedia and I've replicated it here. I don't see that happen too much in my honest classes, but I do see it happen a lot elsewhere. <laughs> right. Notes here, just the, the, the notes on it, the facts. A census to then believe that, those facts. So look at the facts as propositional statements affirming something. This is a belief in it. And then finally, loyalty to it, if you will, faithfulness to it. Yeah, I think hopefully you can see how Augustine would use that in talking about religion. All right, so yeah, there's, there's knowing about Jesus. <laughs> then there's believing it and being loyal to it. Those are different things. You can know all the facts. Now, why say all this? Well, because here's this. I'm, I'm going to preview the skeptic view, and then we'll get into it with Sextus Empiricus. Sextus Empiricus says the problem is people today, when they're dismissive of something, when they're, when we, we, and this is the way we even think of skeptics today, a skeptic will say, a modern skeptic will often say, oh, it's about something that's fantastical. I don't need to know any of this. Okay, not just, I, obviously I don't need to do this one. I automatically don't do this one without investigation. I don't even need to bother with this one. I don't even want to learn about it. Okay. <laughs> so that's, mo that's a modern skeptical attitude. And when I say I'm really content, like now, I don't mean like David Hume would say consigned to the flames, but David Hume also did a lot of reading about that stuff that he said that people should throw in the fire. But the modern skeptic would say, don't even bother, don't waste your time. You don't need to learn about, you might as well learn about fairy tales. And that's what they, it's all the same thing. You don't even need to bother, you don't even learn about it. You don't even learn about fairy tales either. Who cares? So what? Ancient skeptics would say, at least you don't do this and don't do this. Okay? You don't have to. And you don't need to feel that. So that's what suspension of judgment is. Withhold your assent. And if you're holding with your assent, your assent, you're also withholding your fiducia as well. Just hold off on that. But whatever of this you encounter, learn all that you can about it, about everything. So get as much knowledge as you can about everything. Seek it out. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it. It doesn't mean that you believe it's true. It doesn't mean that you're an acolyte or a disciple of whatever it is all of a sudden. Just learn everything that you can about. And that's skepticism as an attitude. And it's really dispositional. I go into the situation going, I'm not, I'm not subscribing to anything. I'm not going to agree to anything at the outset. What do you think about it? What do you, what do you think about stuff? Let me hear it. I at least want to know. I'm not necessarily going to agree with it. I'm not going to lambast it. Tell me about it. And there's kind of a mutual relationship between these two things, where by doing this, 
withholding a sense, you actually find yourself mentally imperturbed. Not perturbed, imperturbed. You'll find yourself far less frustrated by withholding your ascent because as soon as you do this, this is kind of like what I was saying about romanticism last time. When you have, not that this needs to be a system, but once you have a bit, once you have yourself subscribed to a view, all right, I think this now. I, be, I believe this and I'm loyal to this. You'll find that other people are not. And when other people don't agree with you, and it comes to light that they don't agree with you, what do we as humans often want to do then? Fight. <laughs> Fight, right? Um, I see that you disagree with me on this, and um, I would like to prove to you that you are mistaken. Right? And even if I say prove there, maybe I'm being a little too optimistic. Anyone ever argued with anyone on the internet? When it's up, you wasted your time. I say this to someone who does it for a living. Okay. Um, yeah, real. Are you, anybody? Ah, you know, Facebook. Ah, I see that you've vehement disagreement. I now, you're right. You're right. I was wrong. No. <laughs> right. Very. I'm not saying it's impossible. Very, very unlike. But what happens? Then we get that seed. Like this person's an idiot. They're wrong on this thing. And it's people of all different kinds of persuasions. I'm not picking on any particular kind or specific kind of people. But we have that kind of antagonism. Someone disagrees. Someone is wrong, and I have to let them know that they're wrong. Okay? And they're wrong because of some sort of overarching view. They've committed themselves. They believe things that aren't true. Okay. They have the wrong facts. Their, their knowledge is completely off base. Well, the skeptic here would just say, look, you don't have to agree with everybody. You don't have to sign up for what their beliefs are either. Here they have to say, at least know it. You'd be some, this is why I, as a philosopher, know way more about flat earth than I should. At least, I'm at least listening. Like, all right, let me hear your arguments. And for all that, and I think that can actually be helpful. Because if someone immediately, if someone automatically is dismissive to the point, and I am, okay, I, is the earth flat? No. I can say that with great confidence. <laughs> I think. But um, at the same time, I want to hear the art. Well, okay, let me hear what they have to say. Because then I can, then I can go, all right, that's true. All right, now that, the earth, now that you've proved that the earth is flat, okay, my favorite experiment is pouring water onto a plate. This is why floods stay around. If the earth were a ball, look, pour water on a basketball, water just flows right off. But when it floods, the water stays around for a while. Look what happens when you pour water on a plate? It stays there. Earth is flat. Brilliant. Great. Earth is flat. What does that allow us to do? Does it change anything? Even, even, even if it is true, does it change anything? And this is where um, some of you have had me for philosophy of science before, I remember this. When it comes to scientific advancement, it's the fact that you can do stuff with that that is thereby, therefore, thereby practical, that is the, really the efficacy of having those, those views in the first place. You can do stuff with it. Really, you can do stuff with it that makes things better for humanity. Uh, now, is that overly pragmatic? Maybe. But, uh, <laughs> all right, Earth is flat. Now what? What new inventions are you going to make because of your new science? What was that? Oh, sounds a lot like not. Okay, so it's not helpful. So, but at least listen out. So that is, you can, you, can have, you can be dismissive, but at least explore. This, and this, they would say, this is what Socrates did. Socrates never shut anybody down at the outset. Oh, you are much wiser than I, you the throw. Please go on. Let other people shoot themselves in the foot. You don't have to do it for them. Let them talk. And that what this will do is this will produce happiness would be too strong of a word. Contentedness would be too strong of a word, but these notions are related. Are related. Suspend your judgment and you will find yourself mentally imperturbed. Do we like to suspend our judgment, though? <laughs> Especially now. You're going to be the death of me. That's all right. Instead of one of these, it's almost like we walk around with a gavel in hand. What do I mean by that? 
We very much make our proclamations known, do we not? And often loudly. I'm not talking about on little things, major things. And that, I'm not saying that that's bad, but often we don't. Maybe we should, like, let me give a, a, a practical example where I see this where I could go. We could be a little bit more epistemically humble. So epistemic humility, what would that mean? Uh, we know less than we think we do, and maybe we should come to terms with that. And I think that's what the skeptics are getting at here. We'll see it in Jones' it too. But, uh, for example, uh, sometimes the court cases on television. Yeah, this is what comes to mind to me. Court cases on television. The verdict will come out. And the hoi polloi, that is the common people, will already have their own definitive, ready-made reactions to an indictment or um, the, a verdict being read or something like that. Especially where, especially where, I think, I, know, I think there are systematic reasons for looking at certain instances differently, but especially where none of the trial information is privy to the public. And, and then the public will have its own, nope, that person did it or didn't do it. I'm sorry, were you on the jury? Were you privy to the evidence or the manipulation of evidence? For example, I think, I think it's fair to say, now, if I can talk about just a contemporary issue, that the, uh, the grand jury for the Breonna Taylor affair was messed with, okay, in a way that I think is injurious, right? But also that, that knowledge itself is public, okay? But what I want to affirm is people having judgments about somebody did something or didn't do, someone's guilty or not guilty, I'm sorry, who are you? Well, I think they're guilty. Present your case. Well, I just think that they're... Go on. Well, I just think... You can just think all you want. Does reality rest on your judgment itself? Now, do people do this? And I'm not saying you, we, we don't have a... We do have opinion. Okay, but opinion is not the same thing as truth. Maybe we can put opinions propositionally, okay? That's fine. Okay, so you think, you think some ice cream flavor is the best. Okay, I, I can then say X thinks that Y ice cream flavor is the best, and that's a, tr that's a fact. But to say definitively Y ice cream flavor is the best, that now is a different matter altogether. And this is what we'll do. We make our proclamations as though they are proclamations of reality itself. This person is guilty. Were, were you there? Did, have you seen any of the evidence? Or is this just some, some kind of supposition? So the, the problem I'm getting at is not when you have evidence. The problem is when it's just a casual intuition. Not intuition in the sense of uh, <laughs> Kantian philosophy, but intuition in the sense of, well, I just have a feeling that they didn't. Or they, they, that this person, that the, the person who is the uh, defendant, I have a feeling that they did it. Great. What evidence do you have to back up these feelings? If nothing's there, withhold your judgment. You've got no reason to assent to that view. And this is what the skeptics are getting at. Just investigate the facts on things. Just hold, up, hold off on the whole judgment thing. Hold off on the assent. It doesn't, mean that, it doesn't mean that something's not true, but hold off on the assent. Because if you assent to something, it's very easy to just automatically go to that fiducia as well. Now I'm consigned to this. And that's what fiducia is. Now all, I'm all in. To the point where the, the skeptics would also say the problem with fiducia, where you have a loyalty to something, you'd say, I'm this. It could be a religious point of view. It could be an ideological perspective, but once you go, I'm all in, now even if you see counter evidence, it's an anomaly of some kind. It can be explained away. Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? Changes nothing. What does Sextus himself say?
Uh, it starts on Hellenistic philosophy, page 302. That's where the outlines appear in the beginning. And he originally starts by talking about, about inquiry. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of this first one. Because the word that he doesn't like, I mean, he likes the word, but what he says, this is, when you get to assent and fiducia, especially as a partnership, like, I believe it, and yeah, you better too, because it's true, and I, I affirm it, I subscribe to it. That, that as a package, and this is a package deal, obviously includes this as well. But this is not reducible to this. It's what he would call... Dogmatism. And what is dogma and dogmatism? It's related to the word doctor. What is a doctor? Not a physician. What's a doctor? Why? Well, I saw your hand a moment ago. I know you wrote on dogma, right? Dogmatism. Go for it. Uh, I would say it's a firmly held belief that something that someone considers it must be true. Yeah, firmly held belief, it must be true. And, but there's also often an antagonistic, either apologetic in the Greek sense, or proselytizing element. It's true, and you should believe it too. We'll make you believe it, right? whatever that means. And again, I'm not just picking on uh, religion there. That, there's all kinds of perspectives that do this. Do with it. <laughs> how the Soviets would do things like make candy fall out of the top of classrooms. It's rank. Look at Stalin's gold falling from the ceiling. What Father Stalin has done. Nah. Okay, great. Okay, and others. Dogmatism. Yeah, a package deal of truth that this is it. This is the explanatory apparatus of all of reality, and you should believe it too. And. Sexist empiricist is going to go, oh, yeah. Skepticism is not that. I'm not trying to make you a skeptic because they're not skeptic beliefs either. Skepticism is an attitude, not a dogma. It's not, a teach it's not like Platonism. It's not like, at the time, Christianity is around. It's not like Judaism. But Islam's not around yet. It's not like Aristotelianism. It's not like Stoicism. It's not like Epicureanism. We don't have those big beliefs. This is a method not a dogma. So how does he begin? He says this. Um, it's for people investigating things, here's what happens. Either they get a discovery, or the denial that there's been a discovery, or an acknowledgement of the failure to grasp the truth, like we can't, this is immeasurable, we can't get at it. Uh, or else continuation of the investigation. So like when we're doing, uh, science would be a little, I think, too anachronistic here. But when we're doing investigations, we realize, yeah, we're right, we're wrong, we can't get the answer, or we'll keep on going. Right? When it comes to an investigation. We're right, we're wrong, we can't know the answer, or we keep on going. Those are the different <coughs> excuse me, situations we can find ourselves in. Perhaps it's for this reason that in philosophical investigation, some said that they found the truth. Plato. Some denied that it was possible for the truth to be grasped. Carneades. And some continue investigating. The, uh, the contemporaries of Sextus Empiricus at the time, especially the Stoics. Those who are called dogmatists in the narrow sense believe that they have, they have discovered the truth. For example, the Aristotelians, the Epicureans, the Stoics, and certain others. Among those who can deny that truth can be grasped are Carneades, Adamachus, and the other academics. Right, again, that's a synonym for Stoic, or, I'm sorry, synonym for skeptic at the time. Those who continue investigating are the skeptics. Thus, it is reasonable that there should seem to be chiefly three philosophies, the dogmatic, the academic, and the skeptical. Now he is distinguishing between academic and skeptical because there's the way the academic skeptics do things and there's the way real skeptics do things. I don't want to get into the minutiae of that definition, but there is a historical distinction there that can be made. So, so that's what the, those are the three positions. And really two, there's skepticism and there's dogmatism. Find me another, can you find a, can you find a third, some third category? 
again, he distinguishes, because there's a difference, he says, between academic skepticism and <laughs> the skepticism that he's got. So I think we can collapse those into two. Dogmatism and skepticism. Really, any view that you have that you can think of, silly as it may be, fits into one of those two categories. Dogmatism, or you really could say non-dogmatism. He goes into, here's other synonyms for skepticism. We don't need to go into that. Chapter 4, on the, on the following page, 303, because these chapters, <coughs> these chapters are paragraphs, basically. Chapter 4, he says this, the skeptical ability, so that, uh, the skeptical belief system, the skeptical ability, it's a skill, it's an ability, it's a craft, not a set of beliefs. That's what modern skeptics, on the other hand, I think are themselves a kind of dogmatist. Right? You have to believe in physicalism, okay? Well, which is 100 years ago. Materialism, physicalism. There's only the physical world. There's no supernatural. There's no immaterial, period. It could be someone like Thomas Nagel, who's an atheist, but would say, um, maybe there's non-physical stuff out there. Maybe. And gets lambasted. So, maybe, <laughs> maybe, try and recognize what we mean by dog, or what is meant by dogmatism and not dogmatism. Modern skepticism is very much about that. There are things you have to believe in order to be it. But here, look at this. The skeptical ability is the ability to set in opposition appearances and ideas in any manner whatsoever. The result of which is first... Excuse me. And because of an equal force of the opposed objects and arguments, final suspension of judgment, epoche, is achieved. And then freedom from disturbance, ataraxia. Just drop those two words there in the Greek. Let's stop. It. Let's just break that down for a moment. Skepticism is an ability. That allows you to put multiple notitia in opposition to each other. What does that mean? If you go back and take a look at your syllabus, you will notice on there that I have one of the things that I say is that in, in my like course objectives is I say I want you to be able to compare and contrast varying ideas in a way that demonstrates a synthesis of thought. That means that I expect you to be able to take two things that are different and look at them unto themselves, distinguish them, without having to subscribe to them. <coughs> oh. Without having to subscribe to them, but to be able to distinguish them. Without having to, without having to subscribe, to be able to describe without having to subscribe. I don't think that's particularly remarkable. Uh, of a request, of an objective. But what Sextus Empiricus just said here is that this is what skepticism is. The ability to take things at a distance. Okay? Not necessarily, not objectively, but not necessarily neutrally, because you can't divorce yourself from the equation. Okay, but be able to look at things and say, here's how they're different without having to subscribe or decry one or the other. In so doing, you are doing this which yields this. So sometimes I'll read a paper where I can I don't have to guess someone, it's not, and it's not part of the thesis, but I don't have to guess someone's attitude on something. Because they made it very plain about a position on something, which may or may not be controversial. Uh, usually it is. But they've made, they've continually made a point of something without argument. Doesn't happen, again, doesn't happen too often in my honors classes, but someone will assume Something that's not, that's not obvious, but say it as though it is, without scrutiny. So 
So, so saying something without argument, presenting it. This is true. Like saying something like, oh, this person was guilty. Or I heard that happen recently where someone said, oh, someone that was recently killed, well, we knew that we know they were guilty without argument, without any kind of defense whatsoever. Well, maybe it's true even. I'll like, maybe, maybe it's true. But it's not true because of you simply saying so. But this is what happens too often when we get into the when we get into dogma. We can be much more liable to believe things because it fits into the package deal than it would be otherwise. It fits into a mold that we've already assented to. Plus, it makes sense. If something seems to not fit into that, well, then it's just um, it's anomalous, inexplicable. And so often dogmatists will dismiss the exploration of even no sitia. You can't know the facts of other things. What will happen then? So if you get really into fiducia of one position, what will often happen is the censorship of others. We've seen this throughout history. Okay. And I'm not again, various groups. You can think of um, Uh, I can think of examples of Christians saying you can't read uh, various banned books. Okay, books that will be banned. Why? Because they're indecent or, or what have you. But because they betray, you can't know the notitious, like say, the, the Communist Manifesto being banned. Or, vice versa, in certain Soviet, or not, not just Soviet, but certain Communist regimes, the Bible being banned. Okay? Or, the Quran being banned. Or the Bhagavad Gita or something. Or he, even Harry Potter. Okay? Why are you Because it's witchcraft! You're a wizard, Harry. Ah, oh, it's terrifying! Okay? You can't know about that notitia. You'll go out and you know, start summoning Beelzebub. We can't let that happen. So, uh, uh, when this happens a lot, dogmatism starts to prohibit knowledge of other things. Non dogmatism allows you to go, here's what this is, and here's what this is, and here's what you can know about Harry Potter all you want. Doesn't mean you have to be a wizard. You can learn all the facts about Jesus that you want. It doesn't make you have to be a Christian. You can read the Communist Manifesto without being a communist. You can do all this. And that's what, that's, what, that's what skepticism means in this classical sense. So we'll do a little bit more on suspension of judgment next time. I'll be going through mainly the text of Pyrrhonism, some of his other points and specifics. And then we'll get into Dongsi. He has a very different take on this. But a similar attitude of like we don't have to come on if we don't have to come down on something saying this is absolutely true. Have a good day, everybody.